Okay, wonderful. So we'll um, we'll turn to our third speaker. And it's evident that this session is going to lead to a lot of wonderful conversation uh, at the reception this evening and in the break. Uh, so we, we uh, turn now to Frank Lehman. Uh, Frank Lehman is an associate professor of music at Tufts University. His research has explored a range of styles and repertoire from 19th century instrumental compositions to film scores to ambient music. His first book, entitled Hollywood Harmony, was published by Oxford Press in 2018. His work has been featured in The New Yorker, The Chronicle of Higher Education, NPR, and numerous podcasts and interviews. Welcome to Frank. Welcome to Frank. <laughs> Uh, we music theorists have all felt the following delight. We think we know a piece inside and out only to discover on the hundredth listening a new musical connection, a subtle motivic detail, a suddenly unconcealed repetition or a thematic transformation that had been hiding all this time in plain earshot. In compiling a catalog of themes and the relationships in the Star Wars uh, series of films. This is something that started out as a single page guide and is now nearly 40 pages long and growing. I have enjoyed this rush on multiple occasions as anyone who follows me on Twitter must know, I basically is all I talk about. Um, there is no handout for this presentation, although the slides are on uh, the website, uh, SMT website. But if, if there is a handout in a sense, it really is this catalog which you can access online um, at my webpage. Um, all right, so for all this pleasure of discovering the, uh, the hidden connections, I've also felt the inverse, that sense that thematic connections are not being made, that developments are not happening, that transformations are being left unrealized. This impulse to hear thematic transformation is very often frustrated when we turn to Hollywood film music, and its limitations and opportunities is what I'd like to examine in my talk today. My project began with a question. Can a movie, score, a movie score sustain advanced types of thematic transformation? The advanced element here is key. There's no doubt that thematic change in simpler forms positively abounds in film music. Matthew Bribisser Stahl has inventoried a whole host of techniques with which Hollywood composers manipulate, or to use his terminology, mutate recurring musical ideas. Mutagenic strategies include familiar tricks like modal shift, reorchestration, truncation, and so on. Never mind that an uncharitable critic like Adorno would decry these as superficial techniques, uh, what he would say, uh, changes of lighting. These are dramatically effective, compositionally effective, uh, efficient means of musical storytelling, not to mention fun to analyze and to share with others. But what I'm interested in are processes that are more genuinely transformative, procedures which have been amply celebrated specifically with regard to insider-based musical genres, especially post-Beethovenian instrumental music and post-Wagnerian opera. Models we may refer to here are, say, the chained thirds in Brahms's Fourth Symphony, the morphing of the ring, ring theme back uh, into and back out of the Valhalla motif in the ring cycle, and perhaps the whole of Sibelius's mature symphonic output. Going even further afield, we might add the sorts of thoroughgoing recompositions that we hear from jazz artists like Brad Meldow or Ethan I Iverson. So we're talking categories like profound reharmonization, contrapuntal interpenetration, and tonal motivicism. In particular, there are transformational strategies that Bribitzer Stahl might group within his evolution category. These are techniques which, by their very nature, necessitate broad canvases and some degree of pre-compositional planning. And here I'm thinking things like concealed repetition, developing variation, and above all, teleological genesis. This is something that was formulated by Hapikowski, Jackson, and others. Not only do these techniques come with certain temporal requirements, they tend to be dialectical in character, involving a dynamic interactivity of different musical materials, and perhaps a sort of striving for thematic apotheosis or synthesis. Now, as you might guess, these sorts of procedures are considerably more rare in Hollywood, deplorably so, if one might read behind the, between the lines in certain popular critiques, such as recent YouTube video essays that decry, sometimes speciously, the lack of film-spanning musical work in, say, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Why then are simple thematic transformational processes so utterly ubiquitous in Hollywood while advanced methods are disfavored? 
Well, I don't think there's much mystery here. Uh, for one, listeners' attention is usually directed away from the musical soundtrack, so there's little point to engaging in clever compositional processes if they go unheeded by 99% of the listening public. Composers are also given very limited time and little incentive to work on something, some sweeping Sibelian metamorphosis of a theme that may be cut or dialed out of, in, uh, of audibility in the final cut of a film. And there's sometimes, uh, there's something to the absence of univocal authorship within many film scores that risks making adventures in complex and directed musical evolution, well, jagged and inconsistent in most cases. Overall, there simply does not seem to be a high aesthetic or practical priority placed on advanced thematic transformations. The situation changes slightly when one speaks of film franchises rather than single standalone films. Some film series attempt it. Howard Shore's, um, Howard Shore's two Lord of the Rings trilogies come to mind, although the extent of Shore's thematic ingenuity is sometimes exaggerated within some corners. Um, Stephen Ron has recently noted subtle harmonic motivicism in the Dark Knight, uh, Dark Knight trilogy, for example. Um, the best uh, and most consistently inventive franchise that I know of is, in fact, John Powell's How to Train Your Dragon trilogy, something recognized, for instance, in research conducted by Denise Finnegan recently. Um, but many others don't even bother, uh, and to no horrible detriment, I think, to their overall uh, artistic integrity, if we are to be honest with ourselves. And I'd also like to recognize just off the bat that TV is a different animal entirely here with different sorts of opportunities and constraints. Um, although if you come to the FMIG uh, uh, session tomorrow, I think we'll hear Emily Vancella's work on the Av Avatar series, which talks a little bit about some interesting leitmotivic developments there. Well, let's turn back to John Williams, shall we? Uh, over this guy's staggeringly long career, he's worked on a host of major film franchises. But while all of these feature extensive reuse and mutation of themes and leitmotifs, there are only a handful of that more dialectical film-spanning type of transformation. Um, and here, really, the only examples that truly come to mind um, are uh, a couple muscular new statements of Marion's theme in Indy 4 uh, and the conversion of the Nimbus 2000 scherzo uh, from Harry Potter 1 into a kind of bumbling antics theme in the second movie. And this is something Brimister Stolas also pointed out. Uh, if anything, significant transformative treatment of thematic material appears to be pursued more within one-off movies than the sprawling mega-franchise films. Tom Schneller has convincingly demonstrated some real and dramatically motivated and compositionally sophisticated thematic evolution in the scores for the uh, E.T. and especially Close Encounters, uh, namely the progressive assembly and eventual revelation of that film's um, climactic, uh, cathartic mountain theme. And then there's Star Wars. Eight saga films, soon to be nine, very soon, uh, spanning three generations of mythical history and four decades of real Hollywood history. That is to say, it is the greatest opportunity for a single author, long-range, dramatically significant evolutionary treatment of thematic material in the history of cinema. But is it an opportunity taken? Does Williams care? <laughs> yes and no. One example will be instructive to the whole of Williams' approach, I think. With the revival of the franchise in 1999 in uh, episode one, The Phantom Menace, Williams set about deconstructing the famous Darth Vader theme. He infused, it, uh, he infused the melodic and rhythmic and harmonic elements of that leitmotif into a kind of embryo for the young, not yet evil Anakin Skywalker. Uh, the kind of transformations of Anakin's theme within the scope of episode one are reasonably thorough, uh, as Melinda Eschenfelder has established in a recent study. And let's ju I'll, I'll just play, probably don't need to refresh your memory too much, but for the, the uninitiated, here's... <laughs> And here's a sort of decomposed, uh, innocent sounding variant from uh, later on in episode one. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> there you have it. Um, 
So over the larger canvas of the prequel trilogy, instead of just within the span of episode one, where this theme is uh, developed uh, pretty systematically, over the larger range, um, this decomposition never leads to a recomposition. As the dark side grows stronger with young, within Anakin, his youthful theme never, leads, uh, never assembles itself into the mature imperial march. Instead, we hear a scant two new iterations of the theme in episodes two and episodes three, respectively. And in those cases, it's clouded by dissonance, but with no real musically articulated relationship with the theme's retroactively created leitmotivic progenitor. So it's really, it's an opportunity not taken. Not to put too fine a point on it, but Williams either forgot the Anakin theme or decided to ignore its original teleological implications. This is altogether typical. And m while uh, much will hinge on how episode nine wraps things up this Christmas, I doubt we will witness a full flowering of unrealized thematic germs set up in prior films. I could be wrong. Um, but even before the prequel trilogy, James Bueller uh, was sensitive to the apparent thematic immobility of Star Wars leitmotivic canon. He claims that the themes in the series are never inherently unstable or evolutionary. And this is a, 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 a quite complex argument that he devises. I just have a couple pull quotes here in yellow. Nothing actually happens musically in these scores. The themes simply remain the same. None of them are really born of a thematic process. Despite the obvious motivic relationships among themes, the musical logic throughout Star Wars remains that of an original and its derivative. The development is only apparent. Rather than pushing music forward to something new, development simply agitates. Williams' leitmotifs thus prove inadequate to enacting a musical process beyond marking musical time as mere duration. Bueller thus argues, in a rather Adornian fashion, that meaningful motivic transformation in this franchise is severely limited, and both for formal and indeed ideological reasons. I find this came, claim to be accurate in general, but inadequate when it comes to specifics. Actual instances of thematic transformation in context are left unexamined, and this has been an unfortunate tendency in Williams' analysis at large, which is concentrated on themes in their idealized and standalone state at the expense of investigating the way that they be behave in actual underscore. Uh, and of course, actually, there are quite a few exceptions to that, so I don't want to make uh, too reductive a claim. But in order to lend these generalizations about Williams' leitmotivic practice credence, sustained and systematic examination of the actual score is still called for. The slide above presents categories of advanced thematic transformation that I noted earlier, now with examples drawn from the Star Wars franchise. While there is one category, contrapuntal interpenetration, which is truly rare, uh, for the rest, there are dozens upon dozens of instances. And in a, a longer version of this talk, I would try to discuss several of these, particularly the metamorphosis of Yoda's theme into a kind of autonomous revelation motif in Return of the Jedi. This was something also noted by Chloe Huvet in her work. Um, and for the truly curious, these varieties of thematic transformation, there may be a new update to the theme catalog in which they make an appearance. But rather than survey the whole Star Wars canon, I'd like to concentrate on a single case from the most recent movie. The Star Wars sequel trilogy thus far has uh, a striking split when it comes to thematic transformation. With maybe the exception of the rebel fanfare in episode seven, nearly all usages of previously established leitmotifs are citational in nature rather than developmental. By contrast, the new leitmotifs are extremely prone to transformation. Now, whether this constitutes a profound departure in style for the octogenarian composer is an important topic beyond the scope of my presentation, but it is worth illustrating with at least one example of true teleological, ge true teleological genesis that on its face appears to be more systematic and dare I say Sabalian than anything in William's prior oeuvre. The transformation in question is from what I've labeled the tension motif from episode seven into a distinct desperation theme in episode eight. And this, to my knowledge, is the single clearest instance of teleological genesis in the saga. Uh, to paraphrase Hepakowski, teleological genesis is the outgrowth from an unassuming initial motivic seed through repetition, through expansion, into a kind of definitive climactic apotheosis. And indeed, it is crucial to the impact of the telic desperation theme uh, that the, uh, its model is innocuous. Uh, as I play both of these, please also take note of the modulatory plan of the tension motif, uh, which is up a minor and then a major third. This becomes po important just a, a, in a little while. Okay, so here is quite uh, anonymous sounding tension. And here is the
the most mature form of the desperation motif from episode eight. Okay. Um, so, before episode eight plays so much with this tension motif, I didn't even bother categorizing it as a light motif. It's barely an incidental idea in episode seven, not even appearing on the commercial soundtrack album. So, people, you know, sort of casually familiar with the score would not even know that it exists. Um, it's also not particularly memorable or characteristic as a tune. It's kind of a, just a generic agitato figure based on a uh, scale degree one, three, two, four, one pattern in minor. Uh, that's something that's rife and generally unmarked in Williams' post-2000 uh, action output in general. So it's not even specific to Star Wars. It's something that just pops up quite a lot. Um, two examples above indicate how it tends to be deployed in early settings. Uh, it's syncopated. It's non-lyrical. It's basically a little minor mode style topic that phases in and out of more uh, prominent material, kind of imperceptibly. So this is a little proto-tension motif. <laughs> Here it immediately liquidates, right? There's, there's nothing distinctive about it after the first two measures. And here's a, a very, very brief glimpse of the motif uh, in an unused cue. Okay, so very brief. Um, beginning right with the first cue in episode eight, however, uh, uh, which is uh, sort of grouped collectively under the... Uh, 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 sequence escape, we can see that Williams creates, uh, treats this tension motif as an integral component of the evolving underscore rather than as just the throwaway gesture. So it gets a huge workout in the first uh, action set piece, this eight minute long cue or complex of cues in episode eight. It appears in at least 10 different guises within that opening battle, and around its sixth iteration, it undergoes an important, if easily missed, transformation in its substitution of scale degree five for four. Four was you know, the sort of setup, and five is the, uh, the destination. Over the course of The Last Jedi score, this idea becomes a veritable red thread, leading through multiple locations and side plots, expanding and in some cases shrinking back down, rarely attaching to moments of heightened symbolic import like some other well-known leitmotifs, but rather kind of content to lie under the surface, persistently coloring the action without drawing attention to itself. Tension en route to desperation does not does on occasion, however, come into contact with other themes, particularly the new March of the Resistance. This dialectic is quite striking in the cue, the supremacy, where a set of closely situated variants on tension alternate with the march, and there the tension motif comes to take on both, both melodic and harmonic similarities with the march's distinguishing characteristics. Um, and I'll display uh, sort of the concluding uh, iterations from this action cue here. So there's a, quite a lot. This is you know, a, a, an arguable, genuine instance of developing variation. Um, yet, as much as things like this may please an, an, an analyst, uh, moments of thematic recombination like this are an exception. Um, the push towards the telic desperation theme is not driven by interactions with other leitmotifs. Its gradual transformation is not the result of pressure from its musical surroundings, but rather the simple dramatic impetus of ever-increasing anxiety. When the disparate developmental techniques that have been influencing tension do come together, it is at the moment of highest narrative urgency in the entire film, with three intercut plot threads all sim simultaneously reaching their climaxes. For the first time, this evolving theme is foregrounded in the sound mix. It's unchallenged by sound effects or dialogue. It's also allowed to sequence in such a way that draws attention to its inherently intensificatory nature, rather than kind of sublimating it back into a pseudo athematic underscore. In other words, we're going to witness the birth of a true, grammatically complete musical theme as the telic endpoint of an ongoing generative process. 
This is for the first, the last, and potentially the only time in the series that this happens. And it's a birth that it even knows where it's coming from genealogically. Listen to the, when you hear this, listen to the modulatory plan. You'll see it's exactly the same as that uh, inaugural uh, rendition of Tension back in episode seven. And uh, for time's sake, I'm just gonna play the clip with the music and uh, you can sort of see a reduced version way down at the bottom of the screen. And uh, although I said that the, the music is at the foreground, I've taken it a step forward and removed all the sound effects um, so we can, you know, be bad film musicologists here. <laughs> that in and there is there's no sound or or uh, sound music at that stage yes it's so yes i won't editorialize but it's so good uh, okay um after this inignore unignorable utterance of a fully fledged desperation leitmotif what is there left to do well like the first order fleet the theme immediately refragments and recedes into the darkness for the remaining 30 minutes of the film <laughs> to use a very star warsian phrase its destiny has been fulfilled and now it may rest as I hope to have demonstrated in this talk, there is plenty of analytically rewarding work to do with thematic transformation in this franchise, even if, generally speaking, Williams and other film composers are averse to long-range, film-spanning thematic development. Truthfully, there are as many examples of thwarted or unrealized leitmotivic evolution as there are instances of genuine teleological genesis or developing variation and so on. With Williams finished scoring episode nine, the next and final installment of this trilogy will presumably reveal if the composer had some grand plan to provide thematic fulfillment to every theme in mind all along, uh, to tie together every uh, motivic thread. Right? My bet is no, uh, or at least in, not in a way that would have been inevitable retrospectively. Um, but based on what we've already heard over the past 40 or so years in this franchise, it will be a fascinating and analytically rich score all the same, full of subtle surprises and instructive frustrations. Thank you. really good and interesting. This is very strange. Okay, um, but I want to, since you were talking about teleological, have you ever looked at the film Fantastic Voyage? Mm -hmm. Because that one seems to be teleological, and in fact, it almost seems to be like a music video in that the score is more important and the film goes along, and the transformations are all the way through following the, the voyage. In fact, the way that he doesn't have any music for the first 40 minutes of the film until the voyage starts. Yeah, no, that, that's a, a great example and maybe a bit of an outlier as Leonard Rosenman, the composer for that film, was a bit of an outlier as far as Hollywood you know, Except, yeah. thematic practices go. Um, he had a very almost Bergian sense of how to manipulate his musical right. material, and you see that come through in that movie. It's not a franchise, so I guess I didn't, I didn't break it up, um, but that, that would certainly widen my investigation to start dealing with movies like that. Yeah, thank you. It's great. Yeah, it's wonderful. Hey Frank, that's a uh, great paper. As that scene that you dealt with uh, uh, is, of course, the scene that uh, has gotten a lot of grief. Uh, over, I was wondering if, it, it, as you're kind of pushing this up as this kind of moment of kind of in, maximal kind of integration uh, in, a, in a certain kind of way, uh, nevertheless, it's, it, it's, it's a scene that that uh, critics have seized on as being outside of kind of the Star Wars. Uh, uh, idea, uh, or at least uh, that it makes problematic uh, why that technique wasn't used uh, uh, previously. Uh, yeah. So uh, <laughs> I wonder if you want to uh, uh, speculate a bit on that. I, 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 I don't know exactly what to say other than maybe just to, to um, restate 
what you just said, which is you know, the, the scene. The, the argument is, you know, in 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 this universe as it as it stood for seven films prior that no one used hyperspace ramming as a you know military strategy and then suddenly it's you know uh, miraculously effective um <laughs> and one might wonder i guess uh, the implication is why hasn't williams used thematic uh, you know uh, arrival when it's such a vi viable strategy he could you know sort of shoot a hole through the musical canon i you know that sounds like a nice uh, uh, final paragraph to an article version of this so thank you <laughs> So at the second row and then the first row is the order in which I saw. So. Uh, Frank, terrific. That was great, as always. Um, there is no trusting of the industry to either appreciate or respect the delicacy required for these various advanced transformations. Um, there's just there's just very little I think interest in actually having it. Uh, speaking as an erstwhile film composer, whose you know one cut was a fugue. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, if yeah, yeah, I yeah. have another uh, talk for you. If you'd like no, to but but also I mean like uh, going back to uh, like like I remember uh, Corngold, King's Row. Mm -hmm. I mean there are some beautiful thematic transformations in there, and yet even Corngold mm -hmm. suffered a cut that essentially severed this tie mm -hmm. between some of the things he was doing with mm -hmm. you know kind of the younger characters and then how they uh, they grew, and so. So we, I, it doesn't surprise me at all that these types of, again, very fragile types of relationships required, any composer um, is not going to trust that uh, to the industry. Um, and so it, it doesn't surprise me at all uh, that we, 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 we don't find it as much as we'd like to as theorists or even as much as I think the lay public might find value in it. Um, you know, if we think about like Scorsese's recent essay in the Times, you know, there is less risk yeah. involved in just not bothering. Right. Um, so that's my take on it. Well, thank, thank you. And I, I think that's un the, the unfortunate reality. Although I, I, I want to give credit where credit is due. There, we sometimes do see instances of this, this delicate phenomenon, you know, whether uh, you know, it's sort of slipped under the radar of, you know, the the destructive impulses of everyone else involved on, in the film besides the, the music team or not. Um, and there's also something, I didn't really emphasize this a great deal in the, in the talk, but the fact that we're dealing with franchises which are more often than not nowadays uh, uh, written or, uh, and conceived of by multiple musicians. Um, and on one hand, yeah, it's, it's true that it may be hard to come up with a consistent vision of where a theme is going to go or what kind of transformations are in store for the audience. But at the same time, having lots of people, lots of different styles might offer up opportunities for different sorts of music theoretically interesting manipulations of material, maybe more in terms of style or personal voice than you know, goal-oriented transformations, which, I, which I've been emphasizing. Um, and one also imagines with someone as, as much clout as John Williams, he probably is able to com command uh, a, a little bit more integrity to his scores than the average sort of workaday film composers, and yet even his music is cut up and 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 sliced up and uh, spliced and tracked sometimes beyond recognition, including in these most recent Star Wars films. I mean, uh, he operates under the the New Hollywood intensified continuity editorial regime as much as any other composer, and he suffers. Uh, and enjoys the opportunities that it affords in equal measure as much as they do. Yes, and I think this will be the last question just because of time, so go ahead. Um, thanks, Frank. Um, at the very beginning of your talk, you mentioned something which I think is pretty obvious to a lot of people that in a film, the music is not the foreground, right? You're seeing other things, you know, and, and the music is in the background. Um, but we also hear film music on the soundtracks, um, which is not just when the music is foregrounded but, and, and the video is removed, but all the sound effects are removed and the, the dialogue is, is removed. Um, and, and yet even on the soundtrack, sometimes they don't even include all of the, you know, the whole score. And sometimes what we hear on the soundtrack isn't even the same as what we heard in the film. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about um, thematic transformation in the context of a soundtrack where it really is being foregrounded, but also sliced and diced in various ways. 
Yeah, no, that's, that's a great point. So there's a whole entire other sort of uh, uh, listening culture associated with film beyond just the first uh, viewing in theater, including soundtrack albums, but also uh, performances, uh, both sort of concert arrangements and live to picture performances, which are uh, becoming incredibly popular. And those might, in some cases, afford opportunities to pick out details that were, were not audible. Um, in Williams's case, he often, uh, in justifying writing sort of extended concert arrangements of especially scherzi for action sequences, he, he likes to refer to the fact that these things, you know, so much detail goes into the composition of music for uh, a scenes that in, in some ways are the most complex and compositional interesting uh, things that co film composers write, and then everything is just uh, 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 inaudible underneath explosions or like dinosaur uh, you know, screams and so on. Um, and, and this provides a kind of rationale to revisit them and to showcase the orchestra showcase the, the technical performative virtuosity involved there. Um, I think the one place in which uh, uh, you don't need to consult a soundtrack album to hear some, uh, if not radical Sibelius style developments or, or evolutions of themes, at least interesting uh, full presentations would be end credits and, and vanishingly frequently uh, main titles sequences in modern film, because that also gives a, a chance for the music to, to shine. Um, we're, I think we're kind of, I'm, maybe I'm treading on, on dangerous territory here in, in fetishizing, maybe overvalorizing the, the music as so, such here, uh, uh, music itself here, um, since there there is, craft and artistic integrity to something that it can be subordinate and, and incomplete too. So uh, ultimately that's what I would like to refer to is what's happening in underscore, but your point is very well taken that there are other avenues of, of listening and appreciation. Thank you. Well, let's thank our uh, three speakers again and thank you all for being here. <laughs> <laughs>